Mashiach now. Akoi in Peru. Amazing. Beautiful. Chapter 16. The whole chapter today. In one word, Tfunais. Intellectual love. Seems like an oxymoron. Is it love or is it intellectual? So in the previous chapter, we spoke about going above and beyond. You know, the effort that you put in is really the great success of the individual. So let's go further. The alternative says, Zeklau Godel. This is a, a, an important great principle in the divine service of Abenini. And what is the general principle? The essential thing is that we rule over our left part of our heart, the nature that it has, the urges of the heart that are not um, the ones that we want to control us. And how do we do that? By the, the means of the divine light that illuminates our divine soul, which that divine soul, where does it abide? In our brain. And what does it do then? From the brain, that which we understand, that which we know, it rules over the desires of the heart and the left ventricle of the heart. How? Because we're able to develop in our minds a love and awe of God, that will come into our hearts and help us to turn away from the negative urges of the heart. And moreover, not that we shouldn't be disconnected from God even for a moment. And moreover, to be connected with the love of God that is in the right heart, the right ventricle of the heart, that is the revelation of the godly soul there that abides in the, in the brain but reveals itself in the right ventricle of the heart. Right, and and that's the normative way. That's what we've been speaking about till now. So the Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe says, seemingly though, that you know when we speak about true love and awe, means it has to be something palpable in your heart that you, through your understanding of the mind. You bring, bring it to your heart, right? So here's an important principle, another important principle, additional principle that we just, you know, uh, in addition to this, that even when the mind and the intellect, our understanding, we become incapable of producing a revealed love for God in our heart with a real passion for God, right? Instead, it's kind of a love that's hidden in the mind, in the recesses of the heart. Now, why would you be incapable of doing that? It depends on where your soul comes from in the order of creation, as in a, as in a note. Um, that there's a concept of ebor conception and concealment and and therefore it can be that this the soul is born in a in a manner that has a concealment meaning that the love that is in the heart will be concealed won't be openly you know uh feeling in the heart what does this mean it means that the heart will be an understanding heart. Well, heart is feeling. What do you mean understanding? Because it can't develop it into a fiery, passionate love. So it becomes an understanding heart because it does understand the wisdom of the brain. So instead of being excited with the love of God, the heart merely experiences the understanding of God's greatness about your relationship with God, how infinite God is, and how everything is nothing before him. And instead of 
where, as initially we described, that there is a palpable feeling in the heart, here the, the heart knows that it's fitting, that we should pine for him to cl- and want to cleave to him, that we want to, di- we want to be connected to him. And that desire to pine, knowing that that's fitting, right? Again, that's called an understanding heart. Um, and even more so that we should have even a, a kalesa hanefesh, that we should have an expiring of the, of the soul for our desire to be connected. And that that should be expressed, of course, through studying Torah, as we're doing now, and fulfilling mitzvahs, the commandments. And of course, as we learned previously, by doing that, of course, what are you doing? You're embracing the king. Even if the king is wearing garments, you give a you give the king a hug, and the, and the king hugs you. The many layers of garments, it's still a hug of the king. So that awareness that I'm hugging the king, being hugged by the king, right? When we understand that in our mind, it will lead us to a resolve that is fitting and proper to embrace him with heart, soul, and might. Right? Right? And again, in a practical sense, that means the fulfillment of the 613 commandments, right? So, as a result, when the Bainini ponders the subject in the recesses of their hearts and minds, understanding, so what they express with their mouth and their heart accord. In other words, you're going to fulfill what's the resolve of the mind and the heart's understanding in thought, speech, and action. So you'll carry out whatever you need to do. This is called tuna, meaning intellectual. It's an intellectual emotion, meaning it's not a full emotion. It's an understanding heart and an intellectual love. And yet, even though it's not the real awe and love of God, when you engage in doing a mitzvah in that manner, it will have the wings that it will soar. Why? Why should it soar? Why should it have the proper kavana, the proper intent over here? Is because that tvuna, that intellectual, the intellect of intellectual love, right, that leads to the, the recesses of the heart, not open heart, right? Not an open heart of love and all. But it's still leading you to engage in Torah mitzvahs. In other words, uh, if you would not have meditated and thought about being mindful and about your engagement, your relationship with God, God's greatness and as creator and, and, and an appreciation for what a mitzvah is and, and so on. You would have occupied yourself with it, with the mitzvah. You would have, you know, maybe occupied yourself with your own personal concerns, your own physical material concerns or just any other concern, right? Um, uh, as opposed to God's concern of doing a mitzvah, studying Torah. So the fact that you were mindful of this, or even more so thought about it, meditated upon it, that led you to this action, of, as we're doing now, studying Torah, or being charitable, or whatever mitzvah, commandment of God that you fulfill, well, the fact is, it's that mindfulness that led you to it. That intellectual love, uh, an understanding heart, even though, again, it wasn't 
a palpable feeling in the heart that led you to doing it. Well, it led you to do it, so therefore it's the result of that, that and then therefore it gives it wings, as it were, to fly. And the Altar Devon says, actually, this concept is hinted to in the teachings of our sages in the Talmud. Talmud says, sages say in the Talmud, that a, uh, the, that a good deed that we do, meaning a mitzvah, uh, God, Holy One, blessed be He, uh, He joins the good thought to deed. See, Alter Rebbe says that there's very unusual language. What do you mean he joins a good thought to the deed? It should say um, that the um, that the Torah considers that although you had the intent to do something good and didn't do it, that it actually was as if you did it. It doesn't say that. So the Alter Rebbe says, because what does it mean? It means to say that although you um, didn't have a real feeling in the heart, all you had was an intellectual love, kind of skipped the heart in, in its full sense of what the heart is, feelings, open feeling, kind of skipped it. It was an understanding heart, but you skipped it, so God connects it to the deed. Connects it from the mind of your thinking, your input of your uh, mindfulness, and he brings it, can, it joins it to, to action. So, what does that mean? So, he explains that normally what you know comes to your heart. Now, the mind is a very ethereal, you know, even though you know, the brain is you know, a piece of flesh, but it's much more uh, refined, shall we say, in the sense that it's, it, you know, it's got consciousness. The heart doesn't. The heart is, in the end, it's an organ. Now, it's the main organ that pumps blood to the rest of the organs of the, of the body, right? But it's much more magushim. It's much more physical. It's much more, it's a physical organ. Yeah, you don't even, you don't speak of the mind as a physical organ. It is a physical organ. Obviously, it's a physical organ. But the the fact that it has that it has consciousness, so it's it, it's much more of of spirit, and that's why the why the soul rests there, right? Um, abides there. So it's much more um, abstract in that sense. The the heart is much more physical. I mean, in the end, it's an organ; it's just pumping blood, right? Meaning that. When you know something and it comes into your heart, and the heart now, what does it do when you are when you're excited about something? When you are, you know, you, you have a you feel it in your heart. Well, then your body is excited. You, you you move your hands, right? You move your you know you start dancing because you're feeling something in the heart. But not if you don't feel it in your heart. You're not, you know, animated with your body. You're not dancing. If you only have an intellectual love, if you only have an understanding heart, that's what it means that God joins your good thought, machshava toiva, your good thought, right? Your meditative thought, your mindfulness. There was only an intellectual love and didn't come to the heart completely. He joins it to um, to your action to make it have wings and to fly. Something we're going to learn more in chapter 38 through 40, the idea of kavana intent, to make it fly t- to the divine above, which in this instance will be to the world of Bria, to the divine attributes in the world of Bria. Even though you're not motivated by your loving on your heart, but only an understanding heart, right? And 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 again, the 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 brain and the soul there, much more abstract, ethereal, removed from materiality, and therefore that's why you don't you know 
are not animated when it's only an understanding heart, as you would be with a palpable feeling in the heart. Um, so, you know, that, that what you know should come to action? Missing that middle part? That God joins. He connects it. Connects it and therefore brings it in a way that is still a beautiful way to serve God and brings it, elevates it, carries it, that good thought, that funa, love, that intellectual love that is expressed in the mitzvah that is done. It elevates it to the world of Bria. Powerful stuff. That's the end of chapter 16. And, um, yeah. So some people say, all you need is love. What kind of love do you need? What is love? The love of God? Or a love that I feel merely? So, what's the difference between a human being and an animal? Is that a human being, the head is on top, then comes the heart, and then comes the arms and the feet. Versus an animal, most animals, right? They're all on fours. So the head, the heart, and the body are all on the same level. So the human condition is, the way it's supposed to be, is that the mind, right, we learned this in, uh, earlier about the uniqueness of a benini. Uh, this is the human condition, the, the intellectual soul, even not the godly soul, that every human being has the capability of the mind having dominion over the heart. Meaning, your heart has an urge, you can push that away. Furthermore, your mind has an understanding of something it can develop a full palpable feeling in the heart. You have an understanding about God. You can have a love of and awe of God. You have an understanding how great Tanya is. You really feel it. You know, in your heart, you really are in your heart. And and then from the heart, what does it do? Well, mind to the heart to the hands and feet to action to behavior of action speech and of course thought so that is the regular normative way that's the human condition animals are not like that and therefore animals you know the 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 the, the brain is only there to serve its instinct that's not the way it's meant to be for us now we can have we have an animal soul so we can be that way too of course being that's not our desire <laughs> we want to be human or better yet striving to be godly so godly means well the the humanness would be that you understand something it brings to a feeling and then brings to action Godly means that you understand something about God. And that that would bring you to a, a feeling towards God, a love and awe of God. And then that would be that love and awe is enclosed in your actions and your words and in your speech. And is the intent, the motivation for what you do. But I think we probably noticed that we sometimes ourselves or people that we know that they just don't have that they don't have strong feelings but yet somehow they motivate are motivated to do good to do the godly by um, the understanding in their mind that leads to maybe or an intellectual love that leads to an understanding heart so we see that now let's let's examine this for a moment. You know, intellect and emotions 
seemingly are different worlds. So why would intellect affect emotions? Because in intellect, you also have emotions. In emotions, you also have intellect. What does that mean? So pure intellect is when you're studying Tanya, let's say by example, or studying you know, something that you, um, it, it's just pure intellect that you, there's no, um, no sense about it. You get it. It's like your eyes are opened, right? But then when you go, oh, wow, amazing. What's that? What does that mean? That's the emotion in intellect. It's not an emotion, yet, a real emotion, because it's, it's the response to the grasp of an idea the, 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 you know, there becomes something real in your mind. In your mind, you're saying amazing. Once you've said that, oh my gosh, amazing stuff in your mind. So that's the emotion of the intellect. Intellectual love. From there, now it can give birth to a real emotion. Or if it's not you know, capable of the real emotion, of the love and awe that's palpable in the heart, at least in understanding heart. Again, it's a heart. Heart feels. What do you mean it's understanding? It, 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 it's, it's okay. It's good with it. So that understanding heart then will lead the person to, to act. Um, now, important idea is, you know, you give birth to something, to someone, to a child, right? So before you give birth, the child's a part of you. And then the child becomes independent of you. So is the child a part of you or independent of you? Well, both right? At different stages. So likewise, when we speak about intelligence, intelligence, if you were, uh, in, in, in Tanya is called in, in, in the third chapter, it's called mothers. Because what do mothers do? They give birth. What does intellect do? It gives birth. It gives birth to emotions. So in birth, you know, you, you can have the birth of some of of the child in 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 an open revealed way in a concealed way spiritually at least i mean physically you know child can give birth to <laughs> so in the revealed way means that child that you gave birth to the emotion is a reality of its own its own world yes it's infused with the mother the father right and and uh, the the parents that give birth are here metaphorically the mother um is it yes a part of and that means the intelligence therefore is a part of that emotion but yet it becomes an entity of its own meaning a full-blown palpable feeling of love and awe of god or you know or of tanya that you're learning or whatever um mitzvah that you're engaged in but it doesn't always work that way and if we probably look at our lives probably not often do we really have a palpable feeling, at least towards God. Maybe we have palpable feelings in other areas, but those palpable feelings may not even be from the godly soul. It might be the animal soul, on the contrary, right? It might be the lust in the the lust of the heart rather than a love of the heart, right? Meaning they came from different parts of the heart. Right, lust of the heart is the animal soul in the left ventricle of the heart, metaphorically, and the love of the heart is in the right ventricle of the heart, which is the result of our goodness and godliness, and godly soul. So, um, is all you need is love? You know, that concept in the world is about 
um, you doing something for me that makes me feel loved. Here, it's about me doing something. Meditating, thinking about being mindful about God in my life that brings me to a love of him. Whether it's palpable or it's only in the understanding heart, well, both are great. And it's not... uh, it's not a it's not a lesser love when you have that understanding heart it is amazing that we can accomplish such a thing and this by the way in relationships also works really well all you need is love means i have an expectation that you're going to do something for me that's going to make me feel loved and therefore, love you more. Hmm. Here, what this is saying, to translate into human relations, is that let me be mindful of what I can do for you. And that will produce a love. Let me be mindful of, about you, about your greatness. Well, greatness of God, right? So the greatness of, of you. And what I can do for you. What are your needs that I can fulfill for you? That's what we're meditating upon when we speak about God. Well, maybe that's what we should meditate upon in our marriage. Not what have you done for me lately? You know, with that expectation. But what do I expect of me to be mindful of you that will give me a greater feeling towards you and that will lead for me to do something for you as we do for God, a commandment. 613 of them in the study of Torah. That is powerful. That, and if it's even not a complete palpable feeling in your heart, that's okay. You were mindful and it brought you to do something for your loved one. Then indeed, all you need is love. But it's a different kind of love or a different focus on the love. All right, let's open it up. Questions and comments and thoughts. If you got it, folks, this idea, it's pretty powerful. Okay. Two question marks before. Reminder, one o'clock, we have Rambam. Reminder. Also, go to tanyarabbi.com. If you missed anything here, you can get it on the rebound. Julie, uh, is there a chart that always in the body which applied to a Kabbalah? I think he's the right address of the heart. Mm, not certain. I mean, there are certain things, yeah, that show, you know, the body, you know, the chesed on the right and the on the left and so on, the right arm. And you, you can see that. Besides that, I'm not certain. Okay. Yeah, no, sorry, more than that, I don't know. Um, Davida, I know people who tend to be just intellectual, and I know people who tend to be just emotional. How can one truly balance intellect and emotions when one is prone to choose one over the other? Well, that's the mindfulness that we're talking about over here. You know, You know, we are who we are. But that's not where we want to stay. That's, you know, being in the in training 
means that we want to train ourselves to be not merely natural, instinctual animals, even maybe nicer ones, but we want to be godly. We want to be godly. So we got to, you know, with this mindfulness, we can work on it. The alternative is giving us away over here, which is amazing. Okay, Rav, um, we're not going to deal with outside issues now, um, if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to deal with the topic at hand. Yeah, I, I'm just a reminder that uh, we're going to deal with what we're, our discussion is every day. And anything outside of that, um, if there's time, I can deal with. And that will be only at the end. So don't put it anywhere that, that I'm going to lose the feed. So I, I don't want to deal with anything that is outside our discussion right now. Uh, Sarah, I so basically love is an action, not just an emotion. No, love is love. And the question is, the uniqueness over here is that the, the non-palpable love, but the understanding heart that you have, God joins it to the action, meaning that because it led you to action, action is action, love is love, and intellect is intellect. Because it led you to the action, that's a sign that it's something real. That's the beauty over here. That it's something real. It's not like something, oh, you know, you know you're not really feeling it. You didn't give me enough emotion. Yeah, but I did the deed. I, I, I brought, you know, so, Okay, sometimes you got to work on yourself more to 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 have that emotion or to develop the emotion, but we need to recognize that there's something extremely powerful and meaningful. That's the the, the novelty of this chap of, of this idea over here is that hey, it led me to do this action. And so it wasn't a full blown feeling, but you know. The action is the most important thing. And actually to tie in um, with, um, you know, the, the, the great debate between Tevye, the, the, mil uh, the, the, Tevye the, the milkman and his wife Golda and Fiddler on the Roof, where he asks her, do you love me? Do you love me? And what does she answer? What, what do you mean? For 25 years I washed your clothes and I fed you and so on. So what's he asking? He's asking, like, did you bring love? Did you bring a feeling to me? Did you bring me to feel loved? What did you do? What I had? An, I have an expectation. Do you love me? Did you bring that, you know, romantic sort of feeling that I should have? And what she say? What do you mean? Twenty-five years I've action I've done for you that expresses the love. That expresses the love. So it's the action that's expressing the love. The novelty over here is that even if you don't have that palpable feeling, but it led you to that, that's joined um, in, in our mitzvah that we do for God to, to go on high. It's eternal. It's amazing. And the same thing in human relations. We need to know that. All right, I hope that was clear. I'm going to get to Clubhouse in a moment. I just want to make sure I got all of the... Um, during morning prayer, prior to Shema, reading Emet, and God can bring me to tears, is this is what you're teaching. All right. Okay, good. That's amazing. Okay, uh, Rav... Um, Please, we're, um, again, I'm not going to deal with things outside of our discussion right now. Um, thank you for understanding that. Um, okay. So, David, I know people who will say only intellect. Uh, um like the study of Torah is the only way to connect with, and I know they say the intent is more important to connect. It seems very hard to let go 
of your natural character. Of course, it's hard, and that's our struggle, and that's what we work on ourselves, and that's why we're, you know, having the discussion over here so we can become what we can become. Um, can arrogant, please a reminder, two question marks before you ask a question, so that way I can make that I know that I need to look at it. Can arrogance be good in stubborn and a stubborn child? What is, oh, okay. Sorry, again, we're, uh, we're not going off uh, at this point, okay? I'm going to remain. Um, Mark. Rabbi, it's so wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. It's such a wonderful way to wake up with a nice oral lesson. I just love it. I, I guess what I, I wanted to ask you, you sure. know, related specifically to your topic, is if you're, you know, I still sometimes struggle with trying to separate the idea of your intellect, you know, you know the, the, the mind and body, the, the you know, the, the godly soul versus the sort of animal or animalistic, you know, body. And then when you were speaking of, you know, how like the intellect was the part, you know, how, like I, I sort of feel like tefillah, like the, like the fact that, that we're commanded to pray and to do certain things is essentially God's way of telling us, especially men specifically, that we need to, like, our body needs to, our soul needs to teach our body to do things so that we then will have the intellect to, to carry it out, you know, these rituals and things. Right. So I guess what, what we're trying over here, you know, the Tanya is trying to do with us is that you know we can do it uh in a manner of rote because either we were raised that way or we second nature we became that way at some point in life um but it's you know not engaging the mind and again uh, you know the difference between the human and the animal is you know we're on two feet the head is on top and then comes the heart and then comes the the actions which are um metaphorically or not even not even metaphorically reality your hands and your feet right that that brings you to action um to do you know if you if you look at the letter gimel in hebrew um it is like uh, um, two feet one in front of the other and bending over forward um and the word gimel means gomel to do right so it's to action bring us to action so um yes um we, we, you know the action is the most important thing but uh, but what we're trying to do here and then abandoning in training means to activate the mind that it should feed the heart um now again what we talked about over here and the uniqueness over here is activating the heart can be that it's only an understanding heart and it's not a real, you know, full blown feeling in the heart. And yet that is fine. That's beautiful. That's amazing. So uh, you're right. We've got all these different components and in, in, our, in our being, but here is that whatever kind of mindfulness that we can have that will then becomes the motivation right that usually motivation is something of the heart but here it's you know it starts with the mind that motivates the heart or in, in, inspires the heart right that it brings a, a an excitement to the heart a love in the heart you know and so on that then brings you to action so um when we can think of it in those terms then um then I think we we are moving forward in our lives in this respect. Is that does that resonate? Yeah, Rabbi, that's that's beautiful. I, I just want you to know that as a 
as myself, you know, about tshuva coming from secular to to being more observant, this is for me the the, the hardest thing. And and I, I I'm a little bit of a shliach myself, you know, with some of my friends who are more secular, and to get them to to take action, whether it's you know to lay to fill in or whatever it might be, from a little thing to a a small thing, when they don't intellectually understand it or appreciate it it is a very difficult thing so you right. helped me to, to, with that but you know I, I i'm sure i'm not teaching you anything you're teaching me but that that to me is a really critical point in in the probably a lot of the work you do with with you know folks that are learning more and becoming more interested is how to get them over that hump because they right. didn't grow up doing these rituals and these these rote things so it's new and they, they don't, they say to me, I'm sure they say to you, they say, well, why? Well, that's crazy. Why should I do that? It doesn't make any sense, you know? Right. It's hard, hard to get them to do it. But but if you can explain it in a beautiful way like you're doing, it's, it's very helpful. Great. So thank yes. you. Yes. Actually, I want to add to that, Mark. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, this is one route and um, we'll actually, in, in Chapter 35, we'll come to uh, um, a different angle that we'll, we will discuss. Remember, remember, this is uh, Sefer Shabbini. This is the book of the intermediate, the Benini, right? So we're talking about someone who's already, you know, a committed, a committed Jew, right? And a very committed Jew, right? That they have such um, a mastery over their behavior of uh, thought, speech, and action. So someone who is very distant. So just to to add to what you're saying. Sometimes it could be the other way around, you know, instead, and, and this is the Rebbe's uniqueness in our generation, you know, the Alter Rebbe is teaching from his generation, um, and there's always a novelty in each generation, and there is a novelty in in our generation, seventh generation, the generation is going to finally bring the, the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence into this world, that God's presence will be real and palpable in this world, and that's where redemption, Mashiach, means. And how can it be done is the opposite. What I was talking about till now is from up, down, from the head to the heart to your actions. But there's another way, and that's called down up. What's down up? Meaning, start with your actions. Just do it. Just do the mitzvah. You know, and from doing the mitzvah, you will come to feel something and appreciate about the mitzvah. So it's actually the other way around. That, you know, this is not, again, this is not the, the, the way we're talking about over here, but there is another way of inspiring a person. And how come? Because in the end, Torah and mitzvahs is a part of the Jewish soul, and therefore it's a part of their DNA. And sometimes just by doing the act, you can release something of their soul. Now, if it's something that's really distant from them, and like you said, Mark, you know, that they're questioning and this and that, uh, you know, so maybe it's got to be something that is a little more, you know, that they're more at home with. So instead of like, you know, praying three times a day, you went, oh, whoa. Well, I haven't prayed since, uh, you know, before COVID on Yom Kippur. <laughs> you know? um, so maybe that's a little too distant. Maybe Kiddush Friday night with your family. Get your family around the table. Make a Kiddush. Sanctify the day. Have some challah. You know, kosher wine, kosher bread, you know, and um, challah and, and, and the like. You know, maybe that'll be, and, and just do it, you know. So maybe that's something that'll be easier for them. And then from there, maybe they'll be more open to uh, tefillin or or some other kind of mitzvah. Give tzedakah, you know, maybe learn Torah. Or whatever the case may be, the point I'm making is that um, it, the uniqueness in our generation is down up because that's the concept of the Mashiach ultimately is from within, not from beyond or above. Um, that the reality of God is a reality from within my world, not beyond my world, and um, and therefore introducing a mitzvah to somebody can sometimes just be, uh, you know, just do it. You don't know, understand it. You don't feel it, you know, but you 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 do it because, again, it's part of the DNA. And, you know, I had this week, uh, actually two people. Now, maybe what led them to do this was um, 
you know, one had COVID, another one, their brother is sick. So, you know, uh, so they, you know, wanted to put on tefillin. So um, I FaceTimed them, <laughs> showed them how to do it. And here we're kind of, you know, kind of a lockdown over here a bit, uh, whatever. Um, some craziness, but whatever, that's a different issue. Um, and uh, and helped them with it. And it, you know, they came to doing an action. I don't know how much they understand and appreciate it, but that will come and, you know, needs to be provided. Um, but there can be the other way around also. So um, it's important. And that's actually very unique. You know, hey, what's, what's Chabad known for? We stand on a street corner, 14-year-old boy asks a 70-year-old man, are you Jewish? <laughs> and the man answers, hopefully honestly, that if he is, he is. So would you like to do a mitzvah? No explanation, no understanding. Just, you know, hey, just do it. And what did you do? It put on tefillin. Okay, some people decline, others, uh, uh, okay, you know. But it's, you know, because ultimately, actually, to, uh, Mark, is that, um, is that um, talking to you? No, it's not good, Rabbi. It's fantastic. <laughs> God bless you. So let, I, let, let me share with you. My wife and I, we used, I, I, I used to be uh, running the Chabad house on campus, McGill University. And, um, and you know, when, when it was a, um, when it was um, uh, Sukkot time. So we used to go with my kids that, you know, let's say they were 12, they were 10 years old, uh, eight years old, uh, six or uh, 12, uh, 10, whatever the age were, you know, a couple of years apart they were. Um, and about, you know, a bunch of kids roaming between the McLennan Library and the Red Path Library and it was the path that the many of the students would, you know, between classes take to go from one class to another. And we were there with Lula and Esreg and, um, and you would see, you know, you come up to a Jew and sometimes, so you come up to someone and say, oh, today is Sukkot, come to the Mitzvah. And, and, and the, the girl would say, oh, I haven't done this since high school. And then she would start making the bracha and she would like be all kind of like emotional about it. And it was beautiful and do the Mitzvah. And then sometimes we had the Jew that we saw in the yonder that they saw us and they made a beeline in the other, you know, in a, like a 90 degree angle. My kids would run after them and say, are you Jewish? And they said, uh, come do the mitzvah. He says, no, I got to go to class. And sometimes they were with a non-Jewish friend that says, well, we, we, we don't have class for 10 minutes. The kid's asking you something. Well, why don't you, you know? So, um, and they, and, and sometimes the non-Jew would embarrass them to do the mitzvah. And they, and they did the mitzvah. So, and they did the mitzvah. Um, my point in this is that the person who embraced the mitzvah and because and they, you know, sometimes were emotional about it. And the one who wanted to make a beeline and wanted to escape the mitzvah, in the end, they're really the same. One embraced it and one wanted to push it away. Why did one want to embrace it? Because it's a reflection of them. The mitzvah is part of the DNA of, of a Jewish soul. The one who wanted to run away from the mitzvah was because the DNA of their soul is also a mitzvah, but they want to repress it. They don't want to have anything to do with it. The non-Jew wasn't a re an expression of them. So therefore, they could be very, you know, um, very matter-of-fact about it. The Jew can't be matter-of-fact about it, you know. But the, the non-Jew could be because it's not an expression of their soul, you know. So therefore, they, they would say, hey, what's the problem here? The kid's asking you, you know, it's a big deal. Um, for the Jew, it's a big deal. It's me. So that's why sometimes starting a mitzvah do, uh, or starting and engaging a person, you can start with the mitzvah itself because it is there, every Jew's DNA. Hey, Rabbi, Yasher Koach, and I just want to share one quick sure. story from Rabbi Gil Locke, so I'm sure you know. Sure. From Shalai and Bar Mitzvah, one of my sons, and he told me the story and he also made a YouTube of it that's, I think, got a lot of views, so anybody in the audience could, could look it up, because he would tell it a lot better than me, and I'm going to make it really quick. But it's basically, when he was a 
not a 14 year old, but he was asking people if they're Jewish and trying to get them to lay to fill in, in in Los Angeles. And he did, you know, you, you encounter a lot of negativity. And one particular fellow started swearing at him and saying, how dare you? And, and it was just really nasty and it affected Rabbi Gill. And, you know, he thought about it a lot. And, but anyway, you know, when it was over, he tried to forget it. And then fast forward, like several years later, He's living in Jerusalem, and he's at the hotel, at the Shleaf at the hotel, and he sees a Jew who comes up to him, and he's crying. He says, "Do you remember me?" And it was the same fellow mm-hmm. that had, you know, that had said, you know, really nasty things and not wanted at all to do the mitzvah. And he said, "I want you to know that you had a massive impact on me because I went home and I looked myself in the mirror and I started crying." I said, what have I become that I would treat a rabbi that way? And because of that, I went and I put on the pair of tefillin that I hadn't seen in 20 years that I got for my bar mitzvah, and I've been laying it every day since then. Wow, what a beautiful story. (laughs) What a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, folks, there may uh, there are some questions that are left over, but um, I, my apologies. Um, I'm not, I can't continue now. So I want to just wish everybody um, an amazing uh, an amazing day. I'm Rabbi Ronnie Fine coming to you from Chabad, Zuch and Kadesh in Montreal, Canada. If you want to get more of this, go on to the, the TanyaRabbi.com website that has all of this stuff and uh, and share it with others have a wonderful day thank you so much for for joining